the Ombudsman, Caroline Mitchell. Just to remind you, this session is accredited by the CII. Consequently, you are able to get your CPDs. Turning now to Caroline, uh, we asked for her biography, um, and it was quite interesting when you read it, because Caroline started as a solicitor and then moved to the Ombudsman, looking at the operations and also at the old Ombudsman Bureau. Uh, I didn't like to use the word the old Ombudsman's Bureau, uh, but it was a very important part of our industry. And of course, as you know, it became the Financial Services Ombudsman in 2005. Caroline also not only is a lead Ombudsman, uh, but she's also an adjudicator dealing with general investment complaints as well. Her responsibilities have extended to include complaints about pensions, portfolio management, and of course, general insurance. Um, it's great, my great pleasure to introduce you to Caroline Mitchell. Thank you very much, Peter. Yes, um, I'm afraid I go back in ombudsmaning a terribly long way. Uh, I have been ombudsmaning for, I started in 1984, so what's that, 31 years, um, uh, which is quite a long time, isn't it, really? So I've, I've been there through um, most of the developments of things that have happened. The IOB, of course, when I joined it, um, was a new innovation on the part of the insurers, uh, a voluntary organisation uh, without actually that many members in those days. Uh, we had one ombudsman and one full-time lawyer and two part-time lawyers and I was one of the part-time ones and that was it. Uh, I think the industry thinks it created a monster because now we have about 4,500 members of staff, we've got nearly 300 ombudsmen and everything's on rather a different sort of scale to, um, to what it was. But um, personally, I think the industry should be really proud of itself because uh, as an ombudsman service, we are world leaders. We're the biggest in the world. Uh, not entirely by choice, I'm afraid. A, a little three-letter problem has created that for us, and I'm sure you've all heard about PPI. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we are uh, the organization to which people look and... Um, and they come from all over the world, really, to find out uh, about some sort of ombudsmaning and how it, how it should be done. So what I'm going to do today is tell you a bit about us. Um, I don't want to try and teach anybody to suck eggs, but if you don't have very much to deal with us, there, or you don't deal with us very often, then there are things that kind of slip through and people don't necessarily entirely get about us. And we're accused of doing all sorts of dreadful things and going off on frolics of our own to, to, to be mad, um, whereas, in fact, we're not a frolic of our own and we're not being mad, we're doing what Parliament requires us to do. So I'm just going to do a little bit about that. Look at our plans for the next year, um, the, what, the sort of work we're anticipating, uh, the kind of stuff we've had this year, what we're looking at going forward and, uh, and our budget. And then looking a bit, a bit beyond um, all of that, beyond next year, to look at what our various respective worlds are going to be like in a few years' time. Uh, financial services, I mean, nothing ever stays the same, and there are so many hints and things about how things are going to change hugely in your world. Uh, our world is changing already to try to meet the, the challenges that are coming up, but I'll just explain a little bit about what we're planning to do as well. So... Uh, I hope you'll find that interesting and, and, and you may have some, some ideas of your own um, to feed into that. So, a bit about the Ombudsman. There's a deliberate mistake, uh, she says, on this slide. Uh, I don't know if anybody can guess what it is. Uh, it, well, we, we were not set up by law in 2011. No, we weren't. Uh, that should be 2001, of course, uh, set up under the... Um, Financial Services Markets Act. Uh, who here will admit to having had dealings with us? So probably about a third of you. Okay, so for you, my apologies if I'm repeating stuff that you already know. I will be quick on, <coughs> quick on this point, but I think it's just essential to stress what the core things about us are because was set up under FISMA as ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, and the important bit is that, of course, we are an alternative to the court, set up so that we could um, provide quick, informal uh, resolutions to people's problems with their financial services providers. 
So the first important thing to remember about us is that we have a fair and reasonable jurisdiction. So that means we take into account what the law says. And, you know, if, if we're looking at, a, uh, at, at an insurance dispute, for instance, we'll start off with insurance con policy, see what that says. We'll start off with a legal approach, but that may be too harsh in the circumstances of a particular case. So have, if having had regard to the law and to regulators' rules, guidance, regulations, all that sort of thing, good industry practice, industry codes of practice, we think that the law is too harsh in those particular circumstances. We can make a decision that we think is fair and reasonable. And that's something that I think underwriters in particular have a lot of difficulty with. Usually if we're dealing with big insurers, say, uh, the people at the front end, the people who deal with us know, know about that and they understand it and they know that we have a particular jurisdiction and that's what we're required to do. Um, but then underwriters will get very cross and say, well, that's not what it says in the policy. And, that, you know, they're making it up and, and don't quite understand that that's what we're supposed to do, something that is fair and reasonable. Section 228 of FISMA, that is. And this is looking at individual cases. So we're, we're quite challenged sometimes if we look at areas where we have an awful lot of cases um, because even though they might all seem very similar on the face of it, even PPI, you can't deal with them in a big lump. We just have to look at individual cases. We weren't really set up for the sort of major issues that we find ourselves dealing with these days. Um, so it's the individual facts and circumstances of a particular case that we're looking at. And that's something that I think people also tend to um, overlook perhaps when they come back to us and they say, well, the Ombudsman is inconsistent. Uh, the Ombudsman, you know, there, there are two cases and they were on identical facts and the Ombudsman's reached different decisions. Uh, usually when businesses say that to me, I say, well, prove it. You know, send, send me the cases. And when they do, I'll go through them and discover that there will be something in the cases that are different because it is just on individual cases. Sometimes I think perhaps we don't express ourselves as well as we should uh, in, in making it very clear that it's just the individual facts of the case, but, but that's what it is. So individual cases on a fair and reasonable basis, and we're free to consumers. Uh, now, this is a, a particular core strength, I think, of ombudsmanry, that uh, whichever sector it's in, and there are ombudsmen across um, many sectors in the UK and indeed across the world, that they are all free to consumers. Causes some aggravation. Um, some people say, well, wouldn't it be better to charge a consumer a, a, a small amount of money and they can get it back if they win because otherwise, you know, there's nothing to stop people making spurious, frivolous complaints and that sort of thing. In fact, we find that uh, complaints that we would consider to be frivolous and vexatious is, is a minute proportion, about 4% of the over half a million cases we dealt with last year. Really not very many at all. And that um, the, uh, the particularly stroppy individual who wants to make life difficult would save up if necessary so they got the money to make a complaint. But little old lady who has got a valid complaint would, would be deterred. And uh, it's, it's revisited quite often where, where, when, um, when the, the basis on which we operate is looked at by the regulator of the day. So every three years or so this comes up again. And I should personally be surprised if hell hasn't frozen over before. They do start charging consumers, but um, it's, uh, it's the sort of thing that they consult on <coughs> frequently. And then lastly, of course, the fact that we can make binding awards, and that's awards that are binding on the business if it's accepted by the consumer, if the complaint's upheld within um, the time that's stated. Not, of course, binding on the consumer who can go to court if they want to. I think the consumer who's lost with us probably wouldn't have much luck if they tried going to court since we have a fair and reasonable jurisdiction, which means we have much wider powers than a court would have. But, but people have a right to do that if they want to. Whether or not they ever do, I, I don't know. It's not the sort of thing that we would ever really be very likely to, uh, to hear about. And, of course, we can make an award up to £150,000 um, and make awards for uh, compensation for non-financial loss, for things like distress and inconvenience, pain and suffering, and uh, loss of reputation for that sort of thing. So that's just a, a, a quick reminder of... Um, the basic things that are about us. Now, I don't know, you probably won't be able to see any of the detail of that at all. Uh, this is uh, the incoming case volumes over our life. So the little column on the far left uh, is 2000-2001. 
and the, uh, the column at the other end, on the right-hand end, is our forecast for the next financial year, starting 1st of April this year. And I think you'll see it tells some quite interesting stories, this does. The, um, the grey bits are mortgage endowment complaints, and when I think back to the days when mortgage endowments seemed to be a huge flood, we were completely overwhelmed by mortgage endowment complaints, and look how tiny they are now compared with what we're having to put up with today. So uh, that was them, and you can see they just about went away, the only time in our life, I think, when we had gone down to such an extent. Um, and then, of course, uh, PPI cropped up, PPI being the pink one. The blue one is banking complaints. The middle, sort of mid-blue one is general insurance complaints, and the uh, pale blue one is investment complaints. But PPI, clearly, absolutely massive. The little green lines on the, uh, on the far right are packaged bank accounts, which are turning into a bit of a thing. Hopefully not quite as much of a thing as PPI has been, but um, increasingly, um, increasing numbers of packaged bank accounts. So looking at those, for the, the current year, for PPI we've had from April up until the end of December, we'd had just over 160,000 PPI <laughs> complaints. Um, down now to about 4,000 a week, which is good. I mean, you might think in your business if you've got 4,000 complaints, that would not be cause for celebration. But I can tell you that uh, 80 months or so ago, we were getting 12,000 a week. So 4,000 a week's huge improvement. It was one dreadful week when we had 15,000 new complaints, but I think we were catching up in that week. It's, um, it really doesn't bear thinking about, does it? It's about 66% of our work, um, and uh, over the last quarter, about a 60% uphold rate for um, PPI complaints. So that's gone down. It was higher at one point. We have managed to um, dispose of most of the really uh, straightforward ones, and they've been settled in their hundreds of thousands, um, but the, the, the ones that are left are the much more difficult ones for us to have to deal with. The packaged bank accounts um, from April to December, we had about 11,500 new ones. We're hoping it won't reach the, uh, the, the same realms as PPI, but um, we, we are told that we might have m misunder, misunderstood quite how serious that's going to be. Um, it's different to PPI package bank accounts. It's not an unsuitable product for, well, for some people it's actually quite a suitable product. So uh, once again, they have to be looked at individually to determine what's what. So far, we have resolved um, a million uh, PPI complaints would be over a million now. In terms of everything else, that's the sort of the blue ones down, which is what we call general case work. Uh, we're expecting that we will have resolved about 125,000 of those, and they're fairly steady. And we, as you can see, expect our forecast for next year is that they will probably carry on being, um, being fairly steady. So that's the, uh, that's the sorry tale, which is largely PPI, of course. Now, looking at next year, I don't know if you've um, seen our plan and budget. Uh, if you haven't, it's accessible on our website. Uh, we consult on our plans for the coming year and on our budget every year. The consultation closes next Monday, so you've, if you have a burning view that you want to express and haven't already done that, you've got a week to get back to us. And then this goes to the, um, the FCA board in March, I think it is, for approval, uh, and, and then we'll set our budget. What we're looking at is, is an operating budget of about £220 million, um, pounds, which is uh, a staggering amount of money. When I started doing talks uh, for the Ombudsman Service, it was back in the days when our budget was about uh, 30-something million pounds a year, and I used to feel a bit embarrassed about that because I remember, of course, so long back in IOB days when it was nothing on this kind of scale at all. However, we are now a very large organisation. This year, uh, in insurance terms, we're uh, thinking that we will have probably uh, resolved, <coughs> sorry, received about 33,000 uh, new complaints. So this is excluding PPI. Um, we think we'll probably get about 31,000 next year. And if you know anything different, please, please tell us, because forecasting is not an exact science. Uh, 
you don't always get it right. We work with big tolerances. We work with a plus or minus 15% because you can't really be much more accurate than that because you never know exactly what's going to set things running. Uh, a press campaign uh, or something that suddenly hits the, uh, hits the headlines, some uh, claim that might be rejected that gets everybody's attention, gets everybody going. Bank suddenly discovers it's done something wrong and has to repay lots of people. Things, all, all sorts of things can... Um, impact on demand for us and we're demand led we have to deal with it uh, whatever it may be so there's no question of us being selective about work if, if somebody makes a complaint we have to deal with it so we can only look in fairly general terms but but we've we've, we've been pretty much on um, on the money as far as general insurance is concerned and it's it's a, a very well established area of course and uh, hopefully there's there aren't any surprises but I don't like to say that really because then there might be some surprises Sharing insight is, um, is something that we increasingly think is important for us, and I'll talk a little bit about our payday lending um, work uh, later on. But we have, uh, we have huge knowledge of what goes on right across the industry, and uh, it seems a great shame not to use that and uh, to restrict things to an individual case when, in fact, there might be some wisdoms there that will um, point out perhaps some systemic problems or some problems that may occur in the future that we can tell people about and we can help people um, perhaps avoid making complaints in, in, in the first place. We always say that we're probably the only people who are actually would measure our success by getting much less business than we do because if we can stop complaints from coming in, uh, that's really a good thing. You never stop complaints completely, of course. People will always complain and some people will have cause to complain. Some people will complain anyway. But, but if, if, if that can be dealt with at, at the front end rather than coming through to us, it makes for happier customers who stay with what a doubtless happier business is and uh, a smaller ombudsman service. And I'm sure we'd all think that that was a great idea. Dealing with complaints quickly, um, well, we don't do badly. Um, there have been some fairly uh, strong delays in the past, but I think by and large, we're, apart from PPI, we are fairly on top of things. We deal with about 82% of cases uh, within three months, so that's, that's not bad when you bear in mind that some of them are quite straightforward, but some of them are really very complex and very difficult, and uh, there can be a lot of parties involved and a lot of issues. So... Uh, we continue to work to try to look at ways that we can deal with complaints more quickly because um, as far as we're concerned, the quicker the better, and that, that is better for everybody. I think next year we're looking at having about 1.5 million inquiries, which will probably be... Um, uh, in the same sort of region as we've had this year. And at the inquiry stage, we do a lot of signposting, sending people into other directions if they need to be going to other ombudsmen or if they need to go back to a business first. Uh, it's quite a useful way of dealing with complaints quickly because often an explanation is all that people need to be told that perhaps they've, they, they've got the right outcome. The ombudsman's unlikely to take a different view of things. And then our budget and financial plans. Uh, you will almost certainly know that uh, we have a case fee of £550, although it's quite interesting. We travel around the country and we do uh, events for smaller businesses um, where, because uh, they don't have very much to deal with us and don't really understand how we work. And we, we sort of sit around a table. It's all very interactive and say, do you know what the case fee is? And everybody says, oh, yes, yes, we know what the case fee is. And then they come up with guesses that are anything from about 250 quid to 1,000 quid. So actually, they probably don't know what it is. But anyway, it's £550, the case fee, uh, for each case after the 26th. So every business gets 25 free complaints a year. Uh, that probably doesn't help you very much if you're Barclays or Lloyds, because you probably use that up in the first half hour. But for most small businesses, it's, it's actually great. And it means that uh, most of the businesses that we deal with... Um, don't actually have to pay a case fee at all. It's, and that, that, that was a huge bone of contention, particularly with smaller businesses, but uh, and smaller businesses being ones who get fewer than five, uh, 25 complaints in a year. Uh, that, that's, that has certainly made things a little bit easier for us. 
So we think that this year we will be able to keep the levy the same, the levy which um, is charged according to the various FCA charging blocks. I can't pretend to understand all that, but I think we get about £23 million of our income through the levy. Uh, and we will continue with the group account, which we introduced a couple of years ago and is a, a, a way of... Uh, charging the big contributors to us differently. Um, this was because, as Tony Borman used to say, if you're having the cases delivered by the lorry load, then it's easier to charge by the lorry load rather than by the individual case. Uh, so the, we started off with the four big banks, and then uh, last year we extended that to another four businesses, including two insurers. And these are the eight businesses that give us most of our work. And it seems to have worked quite well. We kind of work out what, we're, what we think we'll get for, from them during the course of the year. And then at the end of the year, we can adjust it up or down. But we've, we've been pretty much on track so far. And this year, we are not um, uh, charging a supplementary PPI case fee again. Uh, we, didn't, we stopped doing that last year. Before that, I think, for the one or two previous years, we charged an additional £350 on top of the 550 case fee. That was because we had to get lots of people in, um, employed and trained to deal with PPI very quickly. So we needed that money up front. That means we've got fairly substantial reserves, which um, we are going to be using up. So we won't be, um, won't be charging a supplementary case fee. Uh, this year, but uh, you may have other questions on our, on our financial plans, which I'll be happy to, um, happy to deal with when we come to questions. Right, so financial services of the future. This is really interesting. I don't know what kind of work you do in, within your own businesses to uh, look at, at where things are going and how the world is going to change and, 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 and what is going to happen. We did... Um, uh, a lot of work on this last year. We have a triennial review which our board sets in hand, which is normally once every three years somebody comes in and looks at us. Uh, the previous one was the National Audit Office looking at value for money and that kind of thing. Before that, Lord Hunt uh, did his report on accessibility. Um, we had the fair and reasonable jurisdiction looked at before that. But this, last year it was different. We went to somebody called the Future Foundation and asked them to look outwards rather than inwards so they could look at what financial services were likely to be like in the future. And there, there is a microsite uh, called Resolution 2025. You'll, you'll see it up there. Uh, and if you want to go into that, it's actually quite interesting. And it's, there, there are very, about six or seven papers, I think, looking at different aspects of, of how, things might be, um, how things might be changing. Sort of horizon scanning in terms of what society is going to do, what the economy is going to do, what financial services themselves will do, all that kind of thing. They found very much that um, it, it's all going to become much more personal and, um, and service delivery is going to be a huge thing. And, and everywhere I've been over about the last 18 months, people tell me that customer service is absolutely the heart of everything they do. Uh, the FCA says that they want customer service to be at the heart of everything everybody does. Um, we're working on the basis that we want customer service to be at the heart of what we do. So it, it, it is, you know, the, cust the customer is king. It's really important that, um, that one bears that in mind and keeps that as a central thought. Thought. But it's all going to be about building trust, or in some cases rebuilding trust. I look, the insurance sector isn't as badly off, I think, as the banking sector is, um, where I, I think it, it must be dire to go to a dinner party and say you work for a bank. I mean, <laughs> you must be under constant attack, I should think, from people. But uh, the, the insurance sector has... has isn't suffering in the same way, but it still gets the headlines and you still see the things, you know, somebody didn't get paid out because they had the wrong kind of cancer, uh, somebody's been sick on holiday and they've ended up in New York with massive bills because the insurance company wouldn't pay. All these things that get headlines that may be entirely uh, appropriate for these people not to have been paid, but that isn't how it looked and, and it's, um, it just serves to reinforce people's minds that, that, that everybody is out to get them. So there's a lot of work to be done on trust, particularly I think in, for insurance, which is after all a trust-based product in the first place. Um, looking at creating the sort of uh, products that don't have problems and uh, there's, there's a lot to think about. There's an interesting quote that the um, 
uh, Future Foundation came up with from Peter Simpson, who founded First Direct. And he said, uh, my personal view is that the financial services industry has still got a lot to do, particularly focusing on the clarity of the customer proposition and product features and the terms and conditions. Until the industry is persuaded to simplify the whole and write terms and conditions which are designed to aid the customer's understanding rather than protect the organisation, no amount of good customer service will prevent customers feeling aggrieved. And I think that's really interesting. Uh, you see increasingly... Um, products, policies being written in plain English that really is plain English that is understandable and is, 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 is fine and should make it quite clear to people what they're insured for and what they aren't. And then you still see some others where it's, it, it's really very difficult to think that people could work out exactly, um, exactly what it was all about. Blurring the lines, I've mentioned, because uh, everything sort of gets a bit more together, doesn't it? I've got a mobile phone app so when something goes wrong whose fault's that is it the mobile phone provider or is it the bank if i buy my insurance or i get my mortgage through my phone or online um it it, it, it gets sort of confusing about where you can go where a consumer can go for things and i think that's something to uh, something to bear in mind facetime advice i've put up there because uh with the various pension um, freedoms, if I can put it that way, coming in uh, later on in the year. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, particularly from IFAs, about advice. They'll be required to give advice. What's the guidance going to be? Will the guidance actually replicate advice? Will it be something different? Whatever. But um, I know that there are already people who are giving advice on uh, a face-to-face -face, um, on a, through a, a Skype or some other mobile platform, which is quite an interesting way of doing it. Um, social media, of course, we know has, has a huge impact on the way people look at claims, complaints, and on how um, uh, campaigns can build up things. Get out into the outside world very, very quickly now. Uh, somebody's put something on uh, social media and it can be picked up and it can be all over the place, viral, whatever it is, in no time at all. So uh, the world moves much, much quicker than it used to do. And um, insurance itself will probably change. There were, I don't know if any of you were at the ABI's motor conference where there was quite an interesting talk about um, driverless cars. Uh, you haven't, who, who, who insures it and what basis is it insured on and is, is it the driver that's insured or the car that's insured? So this product may, may change very radically. Uh, telematics, that may change the way that um, motor insurance is uh, is, is, uh, is used. Um, biometrics, other things that can introduce a more real-time underwriting, so perhaps things can change. Uh, lots, and, lots and lots of, um, lots of interesting propositions out there that uh, looking, looking at the future of your industry I think is, uh, is, is interesting for you, and I'll be interested to hear if you've um, already done work on that and if you've got any particular views. And then big data. Big data is something that we're quite keen on. There are lots of um, uh, data storage facilities um, available, of course. Uh, Q, my license, the IFR, MID, my AFRA, all sorts of other databases, things where information can be available to you. Um, not universal coverage, not necessarily universally accurate, but there will come a point when there will be. Uh, there'll come a sort of tipping point where actually perhaps it'll just be down to you to press a few buttons and go off and search these databases rather than asking the consumer any questions at all about their past at, um, at underwriting stage. I don't think we're there yet, but I think it's probably not many years off before we will be there. So it's another thing to, uh, another thing to look out for. I think, I, I personally, I find the whole subject really interesting. And that leads us on to how we're going to change and what we're going to be doing in the future. So there will be new ways of working. We've been looking at reforming our processes for quite some time now and will continue to do so, particularly learning from our payday lending work. Uh, and you can see a, a copy of the, um, uh, the front of the report, which we issued all about 
October, November last year, I think, um, a hefty report, about 90 pages of it, looking at um, the, our various experiences of payday lending, because it's an area where we would have expected, because of the volume of payday loans that are taken out and some of the issues that arise, where we would have expected an awful lot of complaints, and we're really not having very many complaints at all. Um, we weren't going out looking for complaints particularly, but if people aren't able to access us or feel that they can't access us, um, then that's, that's rather worrying. We, we started doing completely different sort of work um, through payday lending, putting ombudsmen, adjudicators right up at the front end of the process so that actually we can deal with things over the phone often very, very quickly. Uh, we had a web chat page. Uh, and you'll find all this on our website if, if you're interested in it. Uh, so that's, that's informed a lot of the ways that we're looking at doing things because many complaints can actually be sorted out very quickly. And a lot of insurers have worked with us and, and, and the big banks, of course, on uh, trialling and, and piloting new ways of working. Really, it, it requires somebody who is sort of intelligent and understands the problem and knows how to get to the, the, the core issue and, and what's necessary to put it right at our end, and the same at the business's end. And if you've got that and, and a willingness to cooperate, uh, it, it really works very well, and I think that's, it's to everybody's advantage when that happens. But the sort of things we're looking at, and like, like the payday lending, you know, you can get a payday loan in minutes uh, if you go online, and then you've got a problem, and we say to you, well, go away, go to the business and come back to us in eight weeks' time. Uh, the eight weeks is increasingly an anomaly in today's age where everything happens very quickly and, you know, you can take out many products online too. Something that uh, uh, will probably have to be looked at um, by the regulator in due course. Uh, a world where you deal with everything on your phone or your watch. I'm suspicious of this world because I find that my phone quite often runs out of battery at a key moment and I'd be a bit worried if I was halfway through taking my mortgage out when it did that. However, um, if, you, if you believe the media, they tell us that we will be doing everything from our watches or our phones in due course. Uh, it will be a very digital world and we, uh, we are going to have to respond to that. We now have an online complaint form so that consumers can uh, complain online and download their documents and things and send them to us. That will be helpful. We haven't got to the point yet where anybody can track their complaint through our process, um, but we're working on it and we will, we will get there sooner or later. We have to be responsive and we have to be relevant and that means being much quicker um, and much more personal contact. Uh, it's, it's interesting that as things get more digitalized and more, more technical and you can do everything online, uh, actually what people want when it all goes horribly wrong is to talk to a person rather than, to, um, rather than just to have it all done online again. So uh, we, we, we're putting a lot of work into talking to people, listening to people, finding out what the problem is, talking to them, trying to work out how to put it right. We're also investing in new IT and case handling systems. Uh, the, ones we, the one we have at the moment is 10 years old and um, obviously it will need to be something quite different going forward. And working together is something that... Um, uh, you may not have come across, but as I say, it's, it's largely the, the banks and the larger insurers, although um, uh, we, we do try to work uh, with particular businesses, and I think uh, Mark was saying earlier that we might, were talking about putting some sort of play, thing in hand where we can talk, communicate better between us. So that will, that will be a good thing. Um, we, we, need, we need cooperation. It's in everybody's interests that we get things, um, get things underway much more quickly. There is, um, as you may know, uh, an ADR directive, a bit of EU law, uh, which comes into effect on the 9th of July, which will, uh, has various requirements for the way that uh, complaints should be dealt with through ADR, uh, not just in financial services, but actually across the, across the whole of the retail sector. There won't be very much change to us. We will remain the place where people go to have their financial services complaints resolved. Uh, there will be time limits. Uh, we will have to to uh, deal with a complaint within 90 days, but as I said earlier, we're already doing more than 80% of that, so we should be able to manage that. Unless complaints are very complex, they, then they have an exemption. 
And there are various uh, reporting requirements which we are already putting in hand, but, but there will be some work too for you to do um, on the ADR um, directive, uh, as I imagine you probably already know. And ODR regulation will come into force in January next year about products bought online to have an online um, uh, facility to resolve complaints. So that's basically more or less it. Uh, just a few uh, things of where you can find help and support. Anybody use our technical advice desk? Oh, not very many of you at all. Oh, gosh. Go away. Get, get a problem and ring them up and ask them because I'm told that they are really fantastic. They get thousands of complaints. Uh, thousands of references every year from businesses. You just ring up for an in informal chat. Um, you, you, you may not have met a particular issue before. You might not have been able to work out what our likely approach would be. And, and they'll talk it through with you. They're very good. They know, they know the sort of way we, we look at most things. If they don't, they'll go away and ask somebody and then come back to you. They can't give you a final answer, obviously, because they've only heard your half, of the, uh, your half of the story. But I think they can be really very helpful. And if, if you're not sure at the front end, uh, you know, when you get something in, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really worth talking to, talking to the technical advice desk. Uh, there's a lot of information on our website. Practically everything we deal with is covered one way or another in our technical resource um, at a fairly high level, but should be able to point you in, in an appropriate direction. And, of course, we've, um, we publish our decisions now. Does anybody ever look at our decisions? Good. Excellent. Uh, we started publishing those April last year. There's now about 50,000 on the um, database. Well, since we began, we've issued 200,000 uh, final decisions. So um, a, a lot of them actually recently, I think the numbers were probably a, a bit um, skewed because of PPI with those. But they're really quite helpful. We, we were required to do this um, by amendments to FISMA, but it wasn't something that we objected to particularly. Some businesses didn't like the thought that they might be named in a complaint. Uh, particularly if it hadn't been upheld against them. But actually, we felt that publishing the full range of what we do would give people an opportunity to see quite what, what an extraordinary range it is and that um, the occasional uh, decision that hits the headlines or gets written up a lot in money marketing with lots of cross blogs afterwards uh, is not actually what it's all about. What it's about is just large numbers of perfectly sensible, straightforward, ordinary and not frankly terribly exciting decisions which is actually just what we do all the time so um, I really recommend that, that you have a look at those and, and, and hope you'll find that those are useful I've been told it's not terribly easy to search but um, improvements are being made so if you have had problems there and been discouraged please give it another go so there we are, I'm happy to deal with any questions um, over to you Thank you very much indeed Caroline um, excellent, excellent um, Okay, just a couple of points, Mark, just before you start to get too worried. When Caroline talked about Lloyd's, she talked about Lloyd's Bank, not Lloyd's of London. Um, just go for that. So, Jane has the microphone, please, if we can have some questions. Down here, please, thank you. Thanks, Jane. Roland Ridden, Dual Corporate Risk. Uh, Caroline, the numbers are quite staggering in terms of the number of complaints that you're actually dealing with. Do you feel as if the insurers and banks are actually failing themselves? So, by that... If you look at, for example, uh, some of the decisions you actually report, from an insurance perspective, some of them seem very basic, especially on a personal lines basis or personal lines basis. And you sort of look at them and think, what was the insurer thinking? Mm. And personally, I find the numbers staggering. And I recently had to help somebody on the usual thorny matter of the pre-accident value of their car. And just talking to the insurers, their whole approach to it was just breathtaking in terms of the small amounts of money that are concerned. And then you look at your own website and it's, you're just seeing a repeat of the same thing with just, just mm. different players. So to me, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm thinking it, it's something somewhere along the line is badly broken. Yeah, I mean, I think the numbers, if, if you take PPI out of it, the numbers don't seem to be quite so dreadful. Um, and and uh, should we ever have had this huge avalanche of PPI complaints? Well, that's not for me to say, and we've got them, so nothing we can do about that. Um, in terms of general insurance complaints, 31, 33,000 a year, uh, probably against the number of policies in existence, 
That, that, that's not actually a, a hideous number on the basis that there will always be some sort of complaints. But I do think, but I think you're right. Uh, it is a bit disappointing with insurance sometimes because insurance is a very well-trodden path. I mean, it's not like it's a new subject. There has been an ombudsman, as I say, for over 30 years and quite a lot of the approaches that we have now were developed by Julian Farrand when he was insurance ombudsman. I was working there in, in the late 80s. Um, so it, it, is, it is always a bit disappointing when you get something that you think, well, the answer is obvious. You know, we've, we've published decisions on it. We've got it written down in our technical resource. Of course, an individual case might be different and might need to be treated differently, but then the business should be able to argue why it's different and why it shouldn't follow the normal approach. But I just sometimes feel that you get, you get people organised and, and the people who work with us know what the answer is and then they have to go away and talk to an underwriter somewhere who doesn't understand us and hasn't got the fair and reasonable bit and then therefore won't, won't, won't do what they should be doing and then you get them trained so they know what they should be doing then they move on go somewhere else you get another one and you know how it is but um, yes yeah, sometimes it is, it, it is rather disappointing it's something that we quite often draw attention to in our annual reviews that um, we wouldn't expect to be seeing these sort of complaints certainly in motive valuation I mean, for goodness sake so thank, thank you Ron. you said 31,000 how many of those are actually upheld the, uh, the rate across, the uphold rate across the board last year was 58%, but if you take PPI out, that it's 37% for general, uh, general casework. That includes banking, uh, insurance and investment and, and all the other bits and pieces. Lovely. So, so we, we use that as, as a measure. Um, if a business has uh, an uphold rate of 50%, 50% of cases against them, being upheld, uh, we think that that needs looking at. Uh, if a business has, as some do, a very small um, uphold rate, then we think that they're doing a really excellent job. If I s tell you that uh, building societies, as a general rule, across the board have an uphold rate of about 9%, that's, that, that, that's really good. Um, building societies, are, are, the mutuals, are really very good. But, but it does vary. Um, card protection insurance, uphold rate of about 98%. Mobile phone insurance, uphold rate of about 70-odd percent. SERPs, state earnings-related pensions, um, 3%. So it, it, it varies widely. And you publish these on a fairly regular basis, don't you? We publish them very regularly. We have just published our third quarter uh, figures in Ombudsman News. Um, we publish uh, our annual figures in the annual review, which will be published about the end of May, beginning of June. Uh, but quarterly figures are published in Ombudsman News, and that one came out last week. So there are figures there if you want to have a look at them. Uh, and for those of you who haven't actually seen the uh, periodical release, when we issue our newsletter, we actually always include a link to the Ombudsman. Very, very interesting um, information container. Sir, you have a question. Uh, well, two, actually. One is um, there have been suggestions that uh, pressure on the payday lending sector is pushing people towards loan sharks. And do you see that as a problem? And the second question would be, I never heard the word prosecution in, in all of this. Is that an option? some of these cases. But pro prosecuting whom? Prosecution, people who, who do bad things to customers. Uh, oh, right. Um, okay, well, let, let's deal with that one first. Uh, that's not down to us. Uh, we deal with uh, regulated financial products. If somebody has behaved uh, badly on an individual or a corporate basis towards one or more consumers, uh, it's for the regulated financial conduct authority to take action. Uh, we will tell them if we see something, particularly if we see something systemic, we'll tell them. We tell them about PPI. Um, we, we, we will tell them, but, but it's down to them to take action and not us. As to pushing people towards loan sharks, yep, I've heard that too. And um, uh, I don't know what could happen there because loan sharks aren't regulated, so it wouldn't be an area that we would be able to intervene in. Um, that will require action from government, I suppose. Um, but yes, I've, I've heard that too. Hello, Martin Archer from Collegiate. Um, I was just interested in um, the Ombudsman's approach to all hearings. You, you seem to have rather turned your face against those. The Ombudsman, the PIA Ombudsman certainly did a few that I can remember. Um, of, my own view is for, for larger cases, sort of over 50 grand or 100 grand, there ought to be scope to uh, 
have a quick sit down with the ombudsman interrogating the customer and the advisor. Uh, is that not something you could f sort of find a space for? It's, it's difficult. Uh, I'm not sure how many oral hearings we held last year. Very, very few, I should think. Uh, we resolved over half a million complaints last year, and if we had to do oral hearings in even a small proportion of them, uh, it, it would create desperate problems. I love holding hearings personally. Uh, I find them always very interesting, uh, but they are very, very resource intensive. They take, a, they take up a lot of time. They take up a lot of resource. They're very expensive, uh, not something that we, could, that we could do all the time. So it's not so much that we've turned our face against them. It's just that we don't need to in the majority of cases. Um, in fact, practically everything we do is dealt with on the basis of the papers or investigations that we carry out, uh, and talking to the parties. We do much more of that than we used to. We don't just you know, uh, flip letters backwards and forwards. We do ring up the parties and talk to them. We have the potential to do oral hearings. As I say, I have no idea how many we held. We also have the potential to hold telephone hearings where we can get everybody, um, at least on a conference call, together which is something that, a, that an ombudsman can use if they think it would be useful to them. I think most of, um, well, not most, but many parties would like the opportunity to have a hearing, um, whether they just reach across the table and grab each other's throats <laughs> or just have a robust discussion about what went on. I, th I think a lot of people would like to do that, but um, we, we will only hold one if we think it would be useful to us. And if you're looking at something that happened, you know, perhaps a sale that happened 20 years ago, it's not necessarily going to be very helpful. But, but it, it's still there. It's still something that we can do if we want to. Thank you, Martin. Excellent question. Yes, another one, please. Thank you. Hi, Jamie Venn from Great Lakes. Um, you briefly touched upon um, not wanting to um, deter consumers from making complaints and the need to review processes, um, particularly how eight weeks from a respondent um, is probably something that's going to be reviewed going forward because in today's age, it needs to be somewhat more streamlined. Do you think uh, the Financial Ombudsman Service could do similar in the, the way in which they take on complaints, being that they don't necessarily require complaint forms or the final response form before forwarding it to us, and particularly within the commercial market where we've got certain agents underneath us? Then looking to trace that, it only takes further delays within the Financial Ombudsman Service itself if they if need to go back. If, if, if there is anything you think we could do to speed things up in the particular circumstances of your sort of work, come, come and tell us about them, because we'd like to know. We've got, we've got a massive project going on at the moment looking at new services. Um, the eight weeks, um, I, I just think it will have to be looked at at some stage. I'm, I'm not saying that somebody's going to deal with it next, next year. I don't know. But um, uh, I think you'd all agree that it just, just doesn't seem right. Eight weeks does seem an awfully long time. I had a complaint myself with um, Southwest Trains. Any of you who commute in this part of the world, probably very familiar with Southwest Trains, may have had complaints yourselves. And they came back and said they would, send, uh, they would reply to my complaint within um, 40 working days. And I was incensed. I mean, it just seemed like a ridiculous length of time for a very simple complaint. Somebody should have picked up the phone and been able to give me the answer there and then. So I, th I, th I think the eight weeks will, will have to go at some point. Thank you for that. Any, yes, one, one behind you. Thanks. Uh, Heather Thomas, EC3 Legal. Could you say something about the claims management companies and the impact which they've had on the FOS and the individual complainants, please. Yeah, CMCs, um, love them or hate them, uh, usually provoke a, a fairly uh, divided response one way or another. Of course, the thing to remember about CMCs is they wouldn't be there in the first place if there hadn't been some sort of widespread issue that fits in their business model. I mean, they started off with um, mortgage endowments then moved to uh, PPI. Uh, I understand that they're finding package bank accounts quite attractive now that PPI might be going. But uh, from our point of view, we would rather deal with a consumer in person. Uh, we say that frequently. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we are actually quite easy to deal with. We're very 
user-friendly. Uh, and if people have particular vulnerabilities, we have people trained to deal with them. So uh, there really is no need for anybody to use a, a third party to bring a complaint to us. Having said that, some people are um, time poor, some people are frightened and think we're authority and that we're not going to be nice and friendly, and we can't stop them from doing it. Um, Pete... PPI, there are fewer complaints now, I think, from CMCs because the complaints are getting more complicated and that doesn't fit the business model. The business model requires an awful lot of very similar complaints. Um, and we've done a lot of work with CMCs. They used to send us uh, boxes of um, sort of complaint forms or just signed and no information in them and we'd send them back until they, till they, did, the, uh, till they did the job properly. Uh, we can't stop people using them. They have decreased in number quite a lot, I think. Uh, still active, probably will continue to be. Uh, we, we work with the um, claims management regulator at the MOJ, and of course things may be a little easier for consumers uh, who uh, feel that they've been let down by their claims management company, and now they can uh, go to the legal ombudsman to have that, their complaints reviewed. Thank you, Jen. This one just behind you. Thanks. Hi, it's Susan Andrew from Grant Thornton. Um, we have a number of uh, our clients come to us saying that they find it quite difficult to engage with the FOS on sort of issues of general principle, which they don't understand, which they can be, see being applied in cases, uh, or particularly forward-looking issues where they might have a redress scheme and are, and are wondering whether their redress offers would be acceptable to the FOS. Um, is there anything more that, that firms can do to engage you or that, that you can do to help firms understand general principles and likely approach? Hmm. Uh, well, we do quite a lot of... I mean, we, 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 we publish our approach towards most things. Uh, we don't have sort of hard and fast guidance or anything like that because we are looking at individual cases. So we can, we can say that this is the way we will normally look at something. It may not be the same in, in that particular case because there might be very good reason for that. Uh, we, 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 we talk to the industry. We talk to, we do lots of conferences and things like that that people are at. So um, I'd be surprised if people couldn't sort of figure out what our approach to things was or if they had difficulty talking to us. But if, if they find they're talking to an adjudicator and they're not, they're not kind of getting through to where they want to get through to, um, I suggest that they ask to talk to a manager. Matt Govan, Great Lakes. Um, specifically regarding the uh, London and Lloyds markets, what um, is the Ombudsman doing to train its adjudicators and perhaps even Ombudsman um, in a very uh, different uh, arena um, quite often we find it uh, challenging that we have to explain um, you know some of the fundamental principles of those markets when um, you know really in my opinion um, there should be a basic understanding at the Ombudsman of how those work. Um, well, there certainly should be a basic understanding of, 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 of how things work. Yes, there should be. Uh, we do uh, training for our staff uh, we have quite a lot of ex-industry people working with us anyway, um, and, and they can help, and people do work in teams. Uh, but if you think that there's something specific that is, is, is relevant to a complaint, then you can ask for it to be, if the adjudicator doesn't seem to have grasped it, you can ask for it to be looked at by an ombudsman um, who, who should be able to, uh, to, to, deal with, uh, to, to deal with the issues. Um, I, can't, I, I can't really think of what else I can say. We, we, yeah, I mean, we, we do training, and people should understand, understand you know, what the policy is about. What but do you have something that perhaps is, you know, you have a commercial team, as I understand it. So in, do you look at, um, you know, how the Lloyds and the London market work specifically and provide specific training for those, you know, teams? Quite often you've got delegated authorities, complex, um, you know, distribution chains. Mm. Um, you know, which are is different to the uh, off-the-shelf retail model. Yeah, no, we do, and 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 I know that the ombudsman who works in that area is particularly experienced and has worked in worked in this market himself. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions from the floor? I have, I have a quick one, if I may, Caroline. Um, I can remember in a deep, distant past the the limit that you were allowed to give um, has recently been increased. Is there any view of making sure that that keeps up with what's going on because I mean, 
£150,000, you can't even buy a one-bed flat for that. No, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? If I talk to people, I say, who thinks £150,000 is a lot of money? And everybody puts their hand up, because so £150,000 is a huge amount of money. But when you think that the original... Uh, award limit for the IOB was £100,000 back in 1981. I think you could buy a hell of a lot more in 1981 with £100,000 uh, £100, than you could buy with one hundred and fifty grand today. Um, it's the sort of thing that gets looked at uh, every three years or so when, when we get looked at by the regulator and they normally consult. I think it was last consulted on probably when it went up, which was 2012, I think. Mm. Uh, it'll probably due to be looked at again. But, you know, it's, it's the, the, the limit is the quid pro quo for the fact that we have this fair and reasonable jurisdiction. Um, if you look at the pensions ombudsman who deals with occupational pensions, he has no award limit. He can, he can award millions, uh, but then he has to work much more on the basis of what the law says, much more legal um, framework he works within, the, the sort of the, the freedom that we have to look at things in a, on an individual basis in a fair and reasonable way uh, means that there has to be a limit on, on what we can award, and, and I don't have a problem with that. Lovely. Thank you. Any, any more questions from the floor? Okay, so I'd just like to uh, thank Caroline on behalf of the MGAA and the members here. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, session. So I think you'll join me please in thanking Caroline for her time. <laughs> <laughs>